folks, welcome to the channel. I'm Don. Today I'm looking at a gentleman I don't know, but YouTube makes recommendations based on my viewer history and such. As you know, it does that with yours as well. A gentleman, Sean Ryan, talking about the gap in the fossil record. And he's a for I looked him up just to see who he was. He's a former Navy SEAL, Christian, has almost 4 million subscribers on his YouTube channel, and I never heard of him. Uh, and was in the top 10 podcasters in 2024. So he's influential, much like Russell Brand, who I did a, uh, a thing on his faith recently, why, why he's Christian. And he made, uh, I like the way he presented it. He didn't say he knows that this is true for sure. It just gives him purpose. Fair enough. I got no problem with that. But uh, let's see what Sean Ryan is saying on the gap in the fossil record. And that is true. I mean, it is one of the things that evolutionists, scientists, archaeologists, and, and so on, paleontologists, I suppose, have had to account for as to why there are so few fossils in the record in, of the transitional forms from, you know, whatever, amoeba on up to what have you. And so, you know, tectonic plates might have buried a bunch of them or whatever, but I don't know what this gentleman's argument is going to be, so let's find out. I would love to hear you disprove evolution. Can we do that? Well, the main issue with evolution is the following. The main issue with evolution is we have taken enormous scientific leaps in the fossil records, right? So if evolution is true, then you find single-celled or multi-celled organisms, right? And you go from single-celled or two-celled organisms to four-celled, to eight celled, to 16 celled, you go through a progressive um, evolution, if you will, of these organisms evolving into an increasingly more being like creature. So, evolution says basically that some bacteria got together in a mud puddle and they mated, and we went from single celled organisms to multi celled organisms to quadracellular to hexacellular to multicellular, and then these organisms began to form into systems that created organ systems, and then you basically had what is a rudimentary um, um, non-air-breathing um, organism that's, that was okay. in the water to Anaerobic. an organism that had gills, and then those gills moved out onto land, and then they started to breathe oxygen. And then this whole lineage of species evolved from this. Pause, because the prior one that I just did on the gentleman analogizing, you know, using the mousetrap as an analogy, that all the parts have to be there at once in order for the organism to function properly, for it to be a mousetrap. And that's along the lines, I was listening to a seminar some years ago as well, talking about the complexity of the lungs. And it isn't like as soon as uh, some kind of anaerobic or, or non-oxygen breathing being could just develop lungs and then start breathing. You need all the other apparatus. You need the mouth, the esophageal tube, and then the oxygen has to make its way through the system. So then the capillaries and, and all the different parts and the chemicals within the body, like Oxygen attaches to iron, iron attaches to B-complex or what have you. And so, I mean, just the different chemistries that are involved in the functioning of a system, as he refers to it, and that's a fair name for it. That's, everybody uses it. But even just to produce lungs, it isn't like they could appear overnight. And the idea would be that, okay, let's say this being that was anaerobic decided to become aerobic, decided, I don't mean consciously, but just the adaptation was there. It needed to get out of the water for some reason. So it started to grow little pieces of lung. Its body would have gotten rid of it. Its immune system would have seen that in all likelihood. I don't know. You immunologists may be able to speak to this, but would have seen that as a problem or it wouldn't have continued to grow because it would have taken necessary energy away from the organism to continue to make that adaptation. So, uh, and if I'm misspeaking, I'm fine with that. It opens conversation, but I'm saying it's a matter of like logic of 
just say a, a layman or slightly more than a layman who looks at this says, well, that would be a problem. So doesn't mean evolution didn't happen. It means that may be the wrong way of looking at it and we have to account for it. If that's our present theory of natural selection and adaptation, then we've got to take a look and say, what really happened here? Let's further refine this thing because that doesn't make sense. The problem is there's zero evidence of that. The problem is you have these single-celled organisms and multi-celled organisms, and then there's a, just a giant gap in yeah. the fossil record. And you have animals, and then you have man. But we don't have a fossil record that takes us from single and multi-celled organisms into an entire species, and we just simply ignore that. Wow, and so I didn't know that. We ignore the science that would validate, validate that evolution was, and, and two, for me, when I, when I start to, when I really study the human body, and, and by the way, we have barely scratched the surface of understanding, you know, this, this thing that God created. This ecosystem is so intelligent, and it couldn't, in, not in my opinion, but in the scientific evidence, it could not have been put together by accident. It didn't happen by happenstance. Yeah. Well, I know some folks have a problem with the idea of it happening by accident or such. I mean, natural selection and you, you do need exorbitant amounts of time for these changes to have taken place. Um, and, it, you know, a number of them would have killed off its host. So when you look at the probability of something happening prior to the event, it's highly unlikely. But when you say, well, what is the likelihood after an event of it having happened? It's one. The likelihood is one out of one. That's what happened. So now we're just trying to understand how it happened. And then the discussion is always, well, was there an independent agent, either power, extraordinarily powerful or all-powerful, which, which is commonly called God, that created this, or did it happen just through natural selection or a third or a fourth means that we've yet to uncover. Because one of the things that happens in mankind's history, and we should know this very simply, is that our ideas change, they grow, they get modified. Former ideas that we had of how things happen change as new evidence is uncovered. So evolution may be discarded in 200 years for not a creationist view necessarily, that's not what I'm arguing for, but there might be a third or a fourth iteration of how did we get here. And creationists, assuming mankind hasn't blown ourselves up or some disease hasn't knocked us off by then, would say that th this is just God's way and we're still waiting for Christ to return because, you know, we, things have to get really bad. If you read this book in the Bible or whatever, things are going to go from bad to worse, and then Christ's going to return, and then the good people go here, and the bad ones go there, and all that stuff. So that'll probably still be the line of thinking, because the texts, earlier texts, support it, and, more, and a lot of folks, uh, even though it's increasing the number of people who are abandoning that, it, um, it's still going to have its place in culture. And I'm not saying rightful place. I'm saying it's going to have its impact. It just does. Things, it's had 2000, almost 2,000 years. The Gutenberg Bible has been around, what, 1,500? So say 500 years there and, uh, and all that. So, all right, folks, leave your thoughts. I read them. If you have a suggestion for a video, go with it. Have a wonderful day. See you on another video and keep thinking theology or whatever it is that you're going to think. Hey folks, if you want to take the personality test that I created for my life coaching practice, which is based on the book that I wrote, put your phone up, turn it on camera and focus on this and it'll take you to it. And it'll take you about 20 minutes to complete the test. It's free and you'll get some information on your personality. It's quite detailed, quite revealing. It's kind of fun as well. And I'll be leaving this QR code up on the wall behind me for my regular videos. So I hope you take it and I hope you enjoy it.